Good morning, church family. How we doing out there? Everybody need to grab your seat. I got a couple quick announcements for you. And uh, man, see the way God's moving in you. I got vacation Bible school coming up, and I'm in real need of some workers. Uh, vacation Bible school is going to be June 5th through the 9th. So, uh, man, if you've got time, if you've done a leader's thing or if you've done a guide thing, we need you to volunteer for Vacation Bible School. If you want to work anywhere, see Tiffany and get signed up or see me. And uh, it's Power Up with Jesus, so we're going to power up. Next Sunday, guys, next Sunday is Graduation Sunday. If you know somebody graduating, man, it's almost too late, but call me Monday morning and I can make sure I got them on the list. And uh, that's going to be next Sunday. We'll have a special video and that stuff with our graduates on it and what they're going to be doing. Also, Super Summer's fast approaching. Kids, if you want to go, 6th through 12th grade. If you want to go, June 27th to July 1st, please do that. Also, Laverne has got her sign-up table for Spring Fling out there, and that's going to be May 5th at 530, but she needs you to sign up today, get your ticket, and she's got her table out there, so please do that, okay? All right. Trey's got me leading off, and ushers, if you'll come forward here, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer to get our service started, and we'll go right into worship. I don't know what that was. Okay. Tell me, Father, man, it's, it's good to be in your house. It's good to call you God, because you can handle all situations. You can have anything that comes our way. Tell me, Father, some of this has been a tough week this week. I just pray that you'd go before us this week. Allow us to see you working. Allow us to know that you're already ahead of us, ready to do great and mighty things. I thank you for each smiling face that's here today. I just pray that you'd help us to have a sweet spirit in here as we worship you. Be it Brother Dwayne as we open our word today. I just pray that you speak to each one of our hearts and uh, penetrate us and change us to be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I wandered so aimless, my life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy. Like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. Then, like the blind man, that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander and stray. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Now I have traded the wrongs for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Amen. Give praise. Y'all sound good this morning. Keep Everyone it up. needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, kindness. 
kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the My fears and failures fill my life again. Give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I
Restore in me the joy of my salvation. Take me back to where it all began. Where all I ever wanted was your presence. How I long to be there once again. It's a light of fire. between us remains my life is an altar to you and breathe again on the embers that burn in my heart I'm taken back to the star my life is an altar to you Yeah. 
You kind of want to go, <laughs> are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Wow, thank the Lord for good worship again. Those songs were just so incredible. So grateful to be here, and I'm glad that, that we have the opportunity today to share once again God's um, holy word. Hey, we're like in this, this has been kind of a loose uh, series, you know, but it is, you know, Saddle Up the Great Adventure. I love that line I just caught, you know, I've heard that song a zillion times. Following our leader unto the glorious unknown. 
And that's what makes Jesus so incredible. He takes us places where we've never been before and maybe thought we could never go before. So today we are talking about light, and today we're talking about light keepers, light keepers. So you might ask the question, what exactly um, is a light keeper? Well, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, up and down the east and west coast were just dozens and perhaps hundreds of lighthouses. And of course, this was before the time of electricity and all of that. Um, and so they would, you know, they would have men, and it wasn't man's world. You know, they had men who would live at the lighthouse, and while their responsibility was to, you know, to paint occasionally and make sure the the um, yards, the land was landscaped, and all of that. Their primary responsibility, their sole purpose, really, of being there was to maintain the light. And so every night, because again, there was no electricity, you know, every night they would climb the tower and they would get their torch and they would light this this huge lamp uh, and slide a lens over it and the light would go forth. And of course, it was for the protection of sailors and ships as they neared the shore. That was their whole purpose. And these men were called light keepers. Now, here's the deal. Now, if you go up and down the East Coast, you will still find a vast majority of those same lighthouses there, but what you won't find are light keepers. Because as the world became more automated and electricity and flip a switch and, and set a timer, they found out, they determined that light keepers were no longer necessary. In fact, in the whole United States, there is one, and he's located, works in the uh, Boston Harbor, and the lighthouse there is a national monument, and by decree, they must keep a, a light keeper on duty there. And what's sad is, is that's kind of what happened in the church. You know, if you go back to the early church, everybody was a light keeper. You know, everybody was a, but there were two things, actually. There were little lighthouses, but they also were light keepers. They were responsible. Their sole purpose was to make sure that the light shined. And somewhere along the way through the decades, we have kind of lost that, and we kind of delegated the light-keeping responsibility to a hired holy man uh, called a pastor or assistant pastor, and that kind of became, quote, their job. And boy, that is never what God intended for it to be. He intended each one of us to be light keepers. Now, I am certain, I didn't verify this, but I'm absolutely certain that back in the good old days, there was actually an association, a national association of light keepers, and they would gather themselves together and talk about the responsibilities and jobs that they had. It was something they shared in common, and they would gather together. And what I want to do today is, I want to go all the way back to, oh, let's say AD 31, Maybe It could have been 30, but it was probably 31. And we want to go back to the original Light Keepers Convention. And the, the one that led the convention that day was a guy you may have heard of. His name was Jesus Christ. Okay, He was the Savior of the world. And we're going to hear a little bit more about him in a moment. Um, but he was the Savior of the world. And what he did was he, he decided he would gather all these people um, together, and they would gather on this hillside, and they would, you know, uh, talk about being the light. And so they did that, and it was, was kind of like an all-skate deal, okay? Uh, Eli, you want to get that slide up for me, please? Okay? Um, it was kind of an all-skate deal. Everybody was invited, okay? So word gets out, hey, there's going to be a light keepers convention. Uh, Jesus is teaching. We, you know what we called it, don't you? Yeah, Sermon on the Mount. Okay, but really it was the Light Keepers Convention. Okay, so, so anyway, so here they were, and they all gather up. And on this hillside, um, it was just filled with men, women, and children. Okay, I mean, every, again, it's an old term, but it, you still know what it means. It was an all-skate. Everybody was invited. Everybody goes to the dance floor and dances. Everybody goes to the skate rink, and they all skate. So all these men, women, and children, there were people there of really big faith. And now, now keep in mind, this is early on. They're not sure about this rabbi guy yet, okay? They're just now hearing about him. In fact, this was kind of like his foundational announcement of, hey, this is who I am, and this is how I want you to live kind of thing, okay? But but there were people of big faith there, you know, maybe some of the disciples, all right, were people of big faith, and then there were people of little faith, okay? They didn't have it all together, but there were probably some 
of no faith. In fact, you know what's really crazy? If you were to look on that hillside, and this happened to me this morning as I was studying. It happened to me. So I'm sitting there, and I thought about that group on that hillside. I would have been there. I would have been one of the ones that probably would have gone to hear this young rabbi teach. That's, you know, it's a, it's a thing he did. And, and, you know, it's kind of like going to church. You know, I would have been one of the ones there. And chances are you would have been too. Chances are you would have been too. It was a hillside full of ordinary people, but some were not too ordinary. I, I made a list. You know, there were people like broken people. People have been bruised, people who have been battered by culture and, unfortunately, by the temple, by the temple elite. There were, there were people there that were invisible. I don't mean like the invisible man, but they simply did not exist because they were poor or they were blind, they were disenfranchised, you know, tons of reasons they were invisible. Women would have been in that group. In that culture, women were more property than anything else. And children, hey, students, you'd have been totally ignored. You'd been totally ignored. It's as if you, not only did you, you know, don't speak unless you're spoken to, that wouldn't even matter because you didn't exist. That's some of the ones that have been on the hillside um, that day. Some were untouchable. There were certainly some people that had, perhaps on the fringes, there were some lepers there that they were, decla- they were declared unclean, and that's how they lived their life. Perhaps the woman there, there was a woman there who you know, had been bleeding for 12 years. Remember that story that Jesus taught? Maybe she was there. Maybe she said, you remember she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, then, you know, then, then I would be healed. Maybe she was there. Maybe that's how she heard you know, about this, this young rabbi. and Oh, if I could just touch his garment, then I could be healed. Maybe you were there because you were excluded. You know, I, I got, I'm going to refer to the high school and middle school twice today specifically. And, you know, high school and middle school are great places, you know, to be friends and stuff. But have you noticed there are people excluded all the time? Not in your group, won't ever be in your group. The uncool people, the people who are just a little bit different, you know. And so we exclude them. Well, again, oh, now we would never do that in church. We would never do that in church. Yes, we would too. There are people that exclude. There, are, come on, can we be honest? There are people here in Harrisburg. They walked into our church. They, what are they doing here? We would do it. Excluded people, and and then on my little list of things, you know, fringe people, fringe people. All these people would have been there. All these people, men, women, and children, ordinary and not so ordinary, and they're all there that day. And and then you ask yourself the question. You know, what did Jesus see? As he, as, he sta- as he scans the crowd and looks out over this hillside of all these different pe- people, you've got to wonder, you know, what exactly did Jesus see as he scanned the crowd? Well, here's what's great. Go ahead and change the slide, Eli. Okay, so, so here's the deal. As he looks out on the crowd, let me tell you what he didn't see. He didn't see losers. He didn't see untouchables. He didn't see excluded people, fringe people, you know, weird people. He he didn't see people that weren't welcome in his group because everybody was welcome in his group. He didn't see any of that. You know what he saw? He saw people. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us as your church to see people just as people. And he saw, he saw these people, and he saw them and said, you know what? These are people, if they trust him, if, if they trust me, they can change the world. Amen. Now, keep in mind, this is so crazy. He calls, you know, he says, all skate, everybody come, okay? And then he declares and says, you know what? These people, no matter how ordinary or extraordinary or unordinary they are, they can change the world. And guess what? He sees the same today. He saw it it in first service. Oh, there was probably 60, 70 of us there. He looked down from heaven. He said, I I see people who can change the world. And then this little bit larger crowd, you know, he he looks at this crowd and goes, oh, you know what? You know what I see? I see people, if they trust me, who could change the world. And then then you go to one of the mega churches in America where they run, you know, 30,000 people in a weekend. He looks at that crowd and he goes, you know what I see? I see people who, if they trust me, could change the world. 
So, so if you're looking for a place where you can come and be accepted and loved, I want you to know Jesus' place is supposed to be the place. And he invites you to come join in the group and to be a world changer. So anyway, so here he is. He's scanning the congregation. He sees all these people, you know, and here is what he goes. He hollers out in verse number, number 14, the first part, okay? He hollers out and says this. You are the light of the world. Now, this probably freaked Peter out. I mean, Peter, you know, you know Peter. They always say you're going to know Peter when you get to heaven because he's the guy with the foot-shaped mouth, you know? You'll get it later. It don't matter. But anyway, so, so, you know, so I'm sure if we, I am certain when, when Jesus called Matthew, the tax collector, to be one of the group, I'm sure Peter freaked out. And, and as, as they're sitting there, you know, and they're the people of big faith, you know, they're following this young rabbi. They sold their boats and nets, you know. And when he hollers out and says, look at these people, you know, the, these ordinary and not so ordinary people, these fringe people, invisible people, and, brothers, and say, you are the lie of the world, he's got to freak out. He's going, Jesus, are you? Jesus, are you sure? Do you, do you know this crowd? I mean, don't they have to come to Sunday school five times in a row before they can be a part of us? Some of y'all remember that rule. Actually, it was three. Jesus, do you know? And he did know. He did know. So we're going to look at, at the what and the how and the why. That's the first part. So, so what is it? So Jesus looks at the crowd, and he says, you are the light of the world. And you've got to ask the question, go, how is that possible? Did Jesus not know who was there? Did he not know there were broken, disenfranchised eyes? Did he know there were really big sinners there? Did he know there were probably some people over here who were committing adultery or living together? Did he know over here there were some people who were wrestling with other issues in their life? Did he know that there were thieves and robbers in the crowd? Did he know? And the answer is yes, he did know. So how could he say, you are the light of the world? And the answer is this. In John chapter 8, in verse number 12, Jesus says this. I am, him speaking, I am the light of the world. So you're going, wait. So in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, he's the light of the world, Okay, and yet in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Which one is right? And the answer is both. Both. And that is the how. That is the how. What is your light of the world? And the, world, and the how is this. See, Jesus could say that we were the light of the world because we are not light reflectors, I'm excuse me, light generators, we are light reflectors. Look at our teaching point. It says it well. Okay? Our teaching point is this. Jesus said we are the light. Okay? But, but he wasn't saying that we were light generators. He's saying we were light reflectors. We need to understand there are two kinds of light. There's light that is reflected and there's light that is generated. And when Jesus said that crowd and says to us today, in any church you walk in today, if you were to say that statement, we would know instantly he's not talking about we've got to generate light so we can change the world. Ain't gonna happen. You see, our light, our generated light at best would be anemic and weak. It would look a lot like religion. It would look a lot like churchy stuff. But it would have no power to change the world. Uh, I haven't seen it in a while, but they used to have it on TV. You know those infomercial things? You know, one of the ones they had, and, you, and you, they paint this great picture. You know, you know, what if tomorrow the world comes to an end and you don't have any electricity, and how are you going to be able to see at night? You know, what if your batteries are dead? And they were advertising this flashlight that didn't require batteries. Okay, and what you did was it had a little crank. Y'all remember this? Had a little crank, and you go, woo, 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 woo. You do that for like 35, I was gonna say minutes, but it's probably 35 seconds. Woo, 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 woo. And then after you do that, you get like two minutes of light. Now, the problem is, is that the light is so dim, the only way you can probably even tell it was working is if you pointed it to a piece of paper and you could see a dimness. Now, I'm telling you, listen to me. That's the problem 
when we become light generators. That's the problem. We think we, think we are religion. We think our church. We think our denomination. We think our good works is enough to light the world. And it is not. So, so Jesus comes along, and when he says you're the light of the world, he says, no, 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 you're not light generators. You are light reflectors. And that's how it can happen. That's the how, okay? Jesus is not saying you got to, you've got to generate the light. He says what you've got to do is you've got to reflect the light. So what does our, what does our teaching points say? We are not light generators but light reflectors. Now, this is such a good illustration. Now, if you look out in the western sky... It's raining, so probably you won't be able to do it tonight. But on any clear night, if you look usually, usually toward the western sky, you're going to see this really bright star. I mean, there is no doubt what the brightest star is. You look up there, and there it is, man. You know, And all these other stars are going, I'm jealous, I'm jealous, I won't be like him, I won't be like him. Maybe, maybe not. Because what's crazy is, The brightest star in our sky is not a star at all, but it's a planet. It's the planet Jupiter. That brilliant, you look tonight if if the clouds move out, okay? Look up there, and you're going to see this star up there, and when you see it, remember this. It's not a star at all. It's a planet, and it owns no light of its own, but reflects the light of the sun. So Jupiter is out there, and is shining bright, not because it generates light, but because it reflects light. You take away the light of the sun, and Jupiter becomes a dark spot in the sky. Now listen to me. When we take away and remove the light of the sun, we become dark spots in a dark sky. You want to know why churches are powerless? You want to know why so many of us go, I have no power. It's because we stopped reflecting the true light. And the true light is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not this church. It is not religion. It's not your good works. It's not your abilities. It's Jesus. And we've got to let him reflect off of us into this dark world. Well, a week from, well, a week from Friday, this Friday coming up. Something's going to happen. It happens about every 28 days. The moon's going to rise. Well, it does that all the time. But this Friday is going to be a full moon. Okay? So, so what's going to happen, um, if, it's, if it works out right, because the, moon, the moon's kind of weird. You know, the sun has to rise in the morning. Well, the moon can rise any time. But if it rises at night, so you'll be sitting out there with your wife, you know, in the backyard, and know how wonderful it is, you know, and romantic. And the moon's going to rise up, and it's going to be beautiful. And you're going to say something like this to your wife. You're going to say, oh, isn't that a beautiful moon? And she goes, oh, it's so romantic. You know, it's all so cool and so wonderful, okay? But here's the deal. Guess what? The moon does not generate its own light. It's not a light generator. It's a light reflector. The brilliant, the brilliant light of the moon is reflected because of the sun. If you take the sun away, it simply becomes a dark hole in space. We've got to understand, Jesus, we need you because without you, we're a dark... Hmm, We're a dark hole and an already dark culture. And we cannot be the light of the world trying to generate our little religious works, spinning our little crank, trying to generate light. However, Jesus invites us and calls us to be light reflectors. So then, this is the why. So we get to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16, and he tells us then, you know, the why. He tells us the why. He says this. In the same way, now wait, time out. For time, I had to leave this out, but I'll, I can give you like a, a one-minute synopsis. So, so Jesus says, you're the light of the world. And then he says, you know, a city, a city that's on top of a hill, it cannot be hidden. I mean, it's like an impossibility. It cannot. So you get a city on a hill, it cannot be hidden. And then he goes this, um, you don't light a light and put it under a basket, okay? You remember the little song? You know, hide it under a bush, oh no. I'm going to let it shine. Well, that's where it came from, okay? So, so Jesus says, you can't, you can't light a, you don't, you don't light a light and put it in a basket. It's illogical. It's illogical. But instead, you put it on a lampstand, 
so that its light shines and lights up the whole house and all the people in the house can see that. Okay, so he says in the same way, like the city that's on a hill that can be hidden, in the same way, like a light that can be put under a basket because it's super illogical to light it and then hide it. Okay, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Now, keep in mind, you already figured it out, right? Okay, guess whose light it is? Is it my light? When he says, let your light, are we supposed to be light generators? No, we're light reflectors. So when he says, let your light shine, he's saying, let the light that leaves me and bounces onto you shine on other people, shine out for other people to see so they can see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. So here we are, you know, he says, Hey, listen, let your light shine. Let my light shine through you. Okay. So other people out there who need to know, they're going to see your good works, your Jesus works. Okay. And they're going to do what? Give glory to the Father in heaven. Oh, oh, and guess what? See, it's not our light. It's not even our works. Have you figured out something? I had this thought this morning. I have thoughts a lot. Do you realize how little we have to do with this this God thing? All we do is believe. All we do is have faith. And by fact, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Oh, and that's not of yourselves either. What? What? They may see your good works. Jesus said in John 15, 5, he said, Look, I'm the vine, and you're the branches. Oh, and by the way, without me you can do nothing. So it's not our light and it's not our works. But as we reflect the light and he empowers us to do his works, then we're to let glory be given to God your Father. Let people see our, you know, his good works through us, that they may give glory to your Father that is in heaven. So now, so my question is this, you know, how does that happen? How, how, how does that all pine out? I, that's the why, that they may give glory. Well, D.L. Moody said something that was really cool. D.L. Moody said this, we are told to let our light shine. Got that? And if it does, if it does, we won't need to tell anybody that it does. Isn't that crazy? You know, we're told to let our light shine. And if it does, we won't need to tell anybody about it. You want to know why? See, once again, the religious light, the church light, our anemic, weak, self-generated light, Okay, the world sees that all the time. We'd have to tell them. <laughs> but that's why we spend so much money advertising about this or that. Because we're trying to convince people that we got the answer. <laughs> Maybe that we are the answer. The reason we don't need to tell anybody is because the light of Jesus is so different and so obvious. Write that down. The light of Jesus is so different. Not the light of the Southern Baptist Convention. Not the light of Dorsville Baptist Church. Certainly not the light of Dwayne Taylor. Certainly not any light you may be able to generate. That's not obvious and that's not different. But man, when Jesus Christ is doing his shine thing and it's bouncing off of us and hitting other people, it's obvious and different. That's what Neil Moody's saying. We, we are told to let our light shine. If it does, we won't need to tell anybody about the light. Now look at the second part. Lighthouses don't fire cannons to call attention to their shining. They just shine. And that's so true. See, the, the whole deal with the lighthouse is not how pretty it looks, how nice the paint job, how good the landscaping's done. The whole deal with lighthouses is the light. It's the light. They don't need to shoot cans off and say, boom, I'm a lighthouse. Because the light is the purpose of the lighthouse. Now, here's the deal. We have a tendency, it seems, to fire cannons in the church today. What do they look like? Well, we're, churches are really good at gadgets. we got to come up with some little tricket way to hopefully draw people to our church. 
Some would do all kinds of crazy things. They used to cut the preacher's tie off. They used to throw balloons at him. You know, we've done all kinds of crazy things. All kinds of gadgets, all on the pretext, let's draw people to church. Oh, okay. And then, and then there's this idea of the T-shirt. Now, before you get mad at me, stay with me. Okay? So, so that's a huge industry in America. All kinds of, of Jesus T-shirts. All kinds. Tons. Um, caps. Well, like our Jesus caps. Got the cups. I've got a couple in my office, Jesus cups. I drink my coffee from the Jesus cup. And, and, that's all, and that's all good. Bumper stickers. You know, if you love Jesus, honk. You know? I remember the time we had the signs in Harrisburg sponsored by one of our churches. You know, you know I love Jesus. I always said you shouldn't have to put a sign out telling anybody that. I feel an awesome. Um, um, worship. We, we, have, we have geared up worship to the point where it has to be on par with the world. I mean, some, at some mega churches, when you go there and they got the fog and the smoke and the laser lights cutting across the sky, all these different things, and it's like we've got to be as good as the world. Son, we're better than the world. Jesus is better than the world. Amen. Why do we think we have to have all this jazz to worship? And then I just listed stuff. Stuff. All right. So now that you won't get mad at me, I'll tell you what I'm trying to say. The, the gadgets, the shirts, the cups, the bumper stickers, the worship, and the stuff are fine. As long as they never replace the light. Amen. Now, you can't argue with that. If we're dependent on our fancy worship or our fancy buildings or our fancy programs to replace the light, we are in deep weeds. Amen. Amen. And when Jesus said, or D.L. Moody said, you know, lighthouses don't fire cannons. Listen, it's fine to fire cannons, but don't forget the way you get people to, to the church is by being and shining Jesus. I still say that. I still believe the answer is Jesus Christ. I still believe he is. I believe, man, I'm telling you, when we put Jesus out front and out first, he is a, you want proof? Look at your Bible. Amen. Wherever he went. You know, he, listen, well, Brother Dwayne, they came for the bread. That only happened twice. They came for the bread, all right, the bread of life. He was so authentic and so real, they wanted it. I'm telling you, there's a culture out there. It is dark, and it is hurting, and it is confused, and they have got to have a place to come where the confusion is done away with, where the darkness is replaced with light. And I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the answer, and we've got to be that. We have got to be that. So our teaching point, our shining, our shining is not to bring attention to ourselves, but the glory of God. That's the why. Our shining is not to bring attention to ourselves. We're not going to be promoting Dorisville Baptist Church or one of our staff members. We're going to promote Jesus, okay, and bring glory to God. Our good works are glory casters, throwing glory His way and nothing our way. Now, we wrestle with that. There's an old song sung by the uh, Ogridge Boys back when they were a, a gospel quartet before they went country, and... Um, the words, I, I'm saying it, I might as well sing it again. I, I, I know, like, like Rod Wallace knows every word to every song ever printed, okay? I'm not that good. I do know a lot of songs, but I usually know 10 words from each song. I know about 10 words from this song. But here's what the song said. <clears throat> Nobody wants to play rhythm guitar behind Jesus. But everybody wants to be the lead singer in the band. How's that for profound? See, in so many churches, we want to be the lead singer. We want it to be about us. And that's a collective us. Maybe not just us individually, but it's a collective us. We want to make sure, mm, 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 mm. we want to make sure that church meets our needs. We want to make sure that we come and we're entertained and it's worth for it's worth coming for because it entertains us. We're wrong. It's all about Jesus. He's the lead singer in the band. And if we don't know how to play rhythm guitar, may I suggest we learn. Because we need to be behind the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with all that said now, we got the what, you're the light of the world, world. The how, we're to reflect the light of Jesus, not generate our own. The why is because we're to give glory to the Father. 
We get to the difficult part, the, the warfare part, okay? And our teaching point simply says this. Satan hates the light, and he hates us also. Now, I want you to do you see anything weird, different, I'm sorry to say different, about the word light? Yeah, the L is capital, okay? And I capitalized it because I want you to understand Satan hates the true light. He hates the reflected light. He hates the light of Jesus. Now, now he don't have a problem with our weak, anemic, turn our crank, you know, work that we do. I mean, he don't have any problem with that. You know, Satan doesn't care about a church that's doing nothing. When the church is all about the people, when the church is a country club and not a hospital, he didn't have a problem with that. He won't mess with you, okay? But when we start choosing to not generate light but reflect light and give God the glory, okay, that people might see our Father, he's got a problem with that. He hates that, and guess what? He, when we start doing that, he will hate us too. And he will do anything to keep us from shining. Anything keep us from shining. He has two big weapons that he uses. Deception and discouragement. Deception and discouragement. By deception, I mean he'll lie. You know, Satan doesn't play fair and he'll lie. Uh, one of the favorite things I, you know, I came up with is that, you know, what he'll do is in his lies, his favorite one, two of his favorite lies is this. He will lie to us and tell us that we can when we can't. You know, for instance, he'll lie to you and say, you, you don't need Jesus to be a Christian. He'll even lie and say, you don't need church to be a Christian. And he's half right on that one. I guess you can be a Christian and not go to church. I'm not sure why you would, but I guess you could. He'll lie, but here's the, here's the deal. He'll try to convince you that you can do Jesus without Jesus. You can't. You can't. He'll tell you you can. He can't. You know, just, just go to church. You know, just, just do that. And you can, you can do it without Jesus. You can't do it without Jesus. But he'll tell you you can. And then he'll tell you that you can't when you can. You know, you know, God will speak to your heart, and his word says all things are possible through him. You know, you know, you know with God, everything's possible. I told that little virgin girl, how can these things be? See, I've never known a man. And, and listen, the angel says, hey, with God, all things are possible. He'll tell you that's not true. He'll tell you, okay, that you can't do those things. He, he wants you to become a canter and not a canner. He'll lie to you. And, they, and the discouragement is something called labels. Okay, this is, I discovered, I already knew it, but I rediscovered last night, this is a real problem for me. I tend to believe labels rather than identity. I tend to believe labels. It goes like this. You're less than. You'll never be enough. You're, you're not a good mother. You'll never be a good mother. You're not a good dad and you're never going to be a dad. You'll always be less than. The reason you are passed over for the promotion, yeah, that's because you're less than. The reason, the reason why you, know, you are a failure, because that's what you are, is because you've got the L on your forehead. You are a loser. You were born a loser and you'll stay a loser. Does this ring a bell to anybody? That's what Satan will whisper in your ear. And so often, you know, God has spoken to our hearts to do something big for him. And the whisperer comes along and says, no, 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 you're a loser. You try that and you're going to embarrass God and you're going to embarrass yourself. Ooh. And we listen to these labels. And here's what the big truth that God gave me this morning. He told me, Dwayne, when you believe and wear a label long enough, it becomes a tattoo. That label that you've been carrying around since you were a kid when your mom said you were a loser, it's become a tattoo on you. It's permanent. It's permanent. Now, one thing about labels, if you got some hair on your body and they put a label on you, you can pull it off. But it hurts. But a tattoo, it can be removed but it requires a surgery. It requires a very painful procedure. Don't believe the labels of Satan. 
If Satan can do anything, he wants to, one, he wants you, one, to live in label land where you believe the labels. I'm not by myself on this one. Label land, and then he wants you to live in never land. You've heard of Anna Jonesboro? You know, two towns close together. These two are close together. Label land is where Satan sticks his labels on us, and we believe it. Never land is when you believe I'll never be enough. No one could ever love me. I'll never be married. I'll never be loved. I'll never this. I'll never that. I'll never that. And when he can do that, he knows he can keep our light from shining. You know, so a quote that I used not too long ago here, and I used it on Friday when I talked to the ladies. You know, Satan knows your name but calls you by your sin. Satan knows your name but calls you by your sin. He'll, he'll say, you're an, you know, if you ever had an affair, you're always being, Satan always say, you're an adulterer. You know, if you, if you stole something, you're just a thief. He'll over and over play that record in our heads. Satan knows your name but calls you by your sin. But listen to this. God knows your sin but calls you by your name. Let, let me give you something free today, Okay? If you're hearing a voice in your head, a whisper, I'm not talking about like, Ooh. I'm talking about if you're hearing a whisper in your life, how do you know it's Satan or the Holy Spirit? Okay. If that whisper in your ear is condemning you, it's Satan. If it's condemning your sin, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never condemn you. The Holy Spirit will never condemn you. So be, be aware of that. So what's our teaching point? Well, Satan wants to steal your identity, your true identity, and he wants to replace it with a label. If he can get you believing what others say, what you say, and what he says about you, he knows the chance of your shining is pretty slim. But regardless of what labels he or other people stick on you, you are what God says you are. You are what God says you are. Um, I'm a little bit out of time, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead, okay? You know, here's the deal. You know, Judy bought a label maker. We haven't used it yet, but we bought one. And she wants to label stuff. All right? So, so let's say that she makes two labels. She makes one that says flour and one that says sugar. All right? So then she gives them to me because she trusts me and says, Dwayne, I want you to go into the pantry. I want you to put the flour on the flour. I want you to put the sugar on the sugar. Okay, got that. Got that. So, so I get into the pantry, and there's a problem. First off, I'm not a cook. Secondly, they're both white. I don't know. So I stick two labels on. But oops, I actually put the sugar on the flour and the flour on the sugar. I got a mislabel. Well, let me ask you a question. Does the label on the outside change what's on the inside? Can you hear me over the rain? Are you letting it distract you? Does the label on the outside change what's on the inside? Because I called it flour, does the sugar change the flour? No. Hear me. Just because Satan sticks a label on your outside, he can't change what's on the inside. Your God-given identity. Your God-given identity. Let me share. I mean, this, this group, Cain, has become one of my favorites. And that song, I'm so blessed. You know, on my best day, when I get it all right, when I get up and pray, when I read my Bible, when, when, when you know, I forgive, when I need to forgive, I'm patient with people, I'm loving with people, I'm a child of God. But what we wrestle with is on my worst day, when we don't get it right, when we don't have a quiet time, when we forget to pray, and no, I'm not very forgiving, and no, I'm not very loving, guess what I am on that day? I'm a child of God. That's exactly right. Listen, listen, listen. My performance or any label does not change what I am. I am a child of God, and God is never going to change his mind about me, and he's never going to change his mind about you. Amen. Ephesians 2.10 says this. You are God's masterpiece. Did you write that down? Are you willing to believe that? You are God's Mona Lisa. You're God's Mona Lisa. He has created you anew in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
Old things are passed away. All things have become new. So you can do the good things he planned for you long ago. When's the last time you heard this? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what he has planned for us. So here we are. So Jesus says, we're the light of the world. That's the what. And the how is, he's going to slosh his light all over us. And we in turn are going to reflect it. And the reason why is so we can give glory to God. That's going to make Satan mad. So he's going to start slapping labels on us, declaring us to, declaring us to be less than we are. Less than we are. And then he's going to lie to us. You can't. You never will. And we have to reach a conclusion of this. Who are we going to believe? We're going to believe the liar, the father of lies, or the God of truth. Here's our little teaching point. And it basically says this. You know, it says, uh, I'm still not convinced, still thinking God could never use someone like you. Are you still thinking? Go ahead and change that slide, Eli. Still thinking God could never use Someone like you, with all your scars and wars. With all your scars and wars. Thinking your past performance disqualifies you from your future potential. Can I tell you a story real quick and then we'll be done? Sure. Okay. It was 1837. And it was in Northfield, Massachusetts. And a guy named Dwight was born had eight brothers and sisters, so a total of nine. When Dwight was uh, four years old, his father died. And, of course, back then there was no Social Security, no child welfare, none of that. And so Dwight's mom did the very best she could to raise these nine children on her own. Well, the best she could do was give Dwight a fifth-grade education. After fifth grade, he quit and went to work. Fifth grade. Well, he worked there in the local area, and finally when he was 17 years old, he went to Boston. His uncle owned a shoe store, so he went to work for his uncle in Boston at the shoe store. A year later, when he was 18 years old, Dwight was converted. He met Jesus Christ and was led to the Lord by his Sunday school teacher. Can we have a shout out for the Sunday school teachers? Yeah, you're making a difference. You're making a difference. So after he was converted, after he was saved at age 18, he packs up and leaves Boston and goes to Chicago and begins there preaching. And and he later starts what will be known as the Moody Memorial Church. And turns out this this fifth-grade educated evangelist who smoked cigars and probably danced too, He smoked cigars and and probably danced. He became the premier, and that's a strong word, the premier, the number one, the best well-known evangelist in America. Before he died at age 62, he had preached to over 100 million people. People in a time where there was no Sunday school, excuse me, no speakers, no edu- no electricity, uh, no, none of the stuff that Billy Graham had. Not taking anything from Billy Graham, but none of the things he had. He preached over a hundred million people, and thousands 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 of people were saved through the ministry of a guy named D.L. Moody. So, do you think? If God could take a fifth-grade educated, cigar-smoking, gruff evangelist and use him to preach to hundreds, well, a hundred million people, you think if he did that, he could use you? Do you think you're so warded up and scarred up that God can never use you? No. By grace, all things are possible. Here's what Moody said. Moody said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a person. Really, he said a man. That was 
the context he was speaking, with a man fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. Wow. Are we willing to pray that and say, Father, you know, I, I know, I, I know my potential is not limited with you, and I'm willing, Father, to commit myself to you. If you're here today and you've never done the Jesus, commit to Jesus thing, you heard enough about it, I think, to at least create a hunger in your heart. But have you, did you hear enough to know there's a man named Jesus who loved you, who died for you, who resurrected, and invites anybody by faith, just like D.L. Moody, you know, who are willing to put their faith and trust in him and follow him, turning from their sin, he'll forgive their sins. You know, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation, and Brent's going to be standing down front. And boy, if you want to come and say, hey, whatever happened to that D.L. Moody guy, I want it to happen to me. I want it to happen to me. And sit back, trust Jesus, and wait and see what God can do through and for you. But for us who are Jesus people already, for people like me who wrestle with labels, what label do you need to bring to the altar today? What has Satan been beating you up with? Is it a long time affair? Was it infidelity in your marriage or, or perhaps promiscuity as a teenager? And you're so worried, what if somebody finds out? Maybe some thievery or stealing, cheating. I don't know. But I bet one thing, Satan's probably messing with you. And he's probably slapping a label on you. He's already told you, you'll never be enough. And see, remember I told you I mission in high school twice today, guys? The second time is right now. You know, it, the high school's a label factory. We slap labels on people all the time. And, you know, and I remember, gosh, I, you know, I was a little pudgy in, in junior high, and I remember somebody called me fatty. And, boy, it stuck, bam, like a knife in my heart. And, you know, places like school is a difficult place. Places like the mines or wherever you might work, those labels can stick. Is there, is there a label you need to bring to the altar today? If you will, you can leave it here. I told... I know I preached a little bit long today, but no apologies. I told him, I, if, I'd, if I had forethought, if I knew what God was going to do today and I didn't, I would have put a sticky note on every bulletin. And I would have explained to you right now is the time for you to write your label down. And I would have had you come forward. And next time I preach this message, wherever it might be, I'm going to do that. And have you bring your label and lay it on the altar. How many of you are willing today to just come and pray and say, God, I'm done with labels. By your grace and by your help, I'm done with labels. I'm tired of Satan beating me up by telling me what I'm not. And let me hear what I am through you. Brent will be here. Of course, I'll be down front too. If we can pray with you, the altar is open. Okay? If you want to come. And we're going to lay down the labels today. We're going to move out of Neverland. And understand that with God, all things are possible. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of sharing this today. I had no idea what you are going to do. And you are amazing. And your word is amazing. Thank you that, that we're not less than, we're more than. When we put our faith and trust in you and live in accordance with your will. Thank you for that. Father, for those of us who rest with labels, and dare I say that's most of us. May we be willing to lay those labels down. May we be willing to forget the lies and believe the truth. May we quit trying to generate an anemic, light, anemic light and let you shine and bounce all of us, off of us like Jupiter and like the moon. May we present ourselves to you today. And Jesus, I do pray it. And I pray it believing in your name. Amen. Just as I am without one thing, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, no man 
I have a young lady that came forward today. She surrendered. Delaney Yancey. She come forward today saying, hey, I'm going to honor God. I want to be baptized. And uh, she wants to join this church here and be a member. So you guys rejoice over that. Amen. Delaney wanted to say something. Go ahead. I appreciate every single one of you for being here and taking your time to worship our Father and our Savior. Amen. That's you guys being real, okay? This world's got a lot of problems it throws our way. But the world needs to know we hurt. We got a Savior that's overcome everything. And because he overcome, we can overcome, okay? Because he lives in us, we can do good things. We can be that person that we need to be. We reflect him so much. Dwayne, you got anything? Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. He's back at the back door. But, man, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly my Father, I thank you for Delaney coming forward today. I just thank you for that battle that was won. 
And Heavenly Father, she surrenders to you to be her Lord and Savior. And Heavenly Father, this world wants nothing about that. And Heavenly Father, help us as Christians to lift her up, help us to pray for her, help us to encourage her. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that you just continue to let us see that you created a masterpiece in each one of us. That you created uh, us to shine. You made us a reflective material just to reflect that perfect light to somebody special. And Heavenly Father, use us in mighty ways. Use us, give us a heart that wants to serve you. Give us a heart that will hear your voice, your still small voice, and do the things you call us to do. In Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, Amen. Come extend the right hand of fellowship, please. You'll stay right here to go. Come on.